Top of the morning. Today we have a great show for you with two local celebrity astronauts, Dr. Mary Cleave and Dr. Donald Thomas. So don't touch that remote and we'll be right back. So if you're running electrical power systems where you have to be concerned about you know interference with your transmission grids or any kind of communications, you have to be very aware of what's going on. Again, I want to finish this portion just give me an idea of exactly how small we are in a sense because this is coming in to the earth on a little voyage through the universe okay so you're imagine you're on an interstellar spacecraft and you're heading home okay and you're going to go through various astronomical features out you know on your voyage back and then all of a sudden you're going to see the sun and you're going to go past their Saturn again. We are coming in to approach the Earth. Jupiter. Through the asteroid belt. Hope you don't get hit. <laughs> Here's Mars. The moon. And you made it, you're home. Okay. Cool. So that's where we live. And it's a very fragile place and we really have to be careful taking care of it. Alright, welcome back. Here we are. So with Dr. Mary Cleave and Dr. Donald Thomas are two local celebrity astronauts. Now, let me ask the two of you. So the first thing, obviously, is how did you get involved with being astronauts in the first place? I knew you grew up in New York and uh, as a little girl. How did it come about? Well, I never really thought about being an astronaut, being a little girl growing up in New York. It was th those guys all had crew cuts and they were all guys. <laughs> but when I was in graduate school, after when I had just finished working on my master's, I was working on my PhD, I was working at a water lab and one of the engineers said they're looking for scientists and engineers to go work in space and I went, ooh, that sounds like fun. Sure. So that's how I got involved. Okay. It was very sort of circuitous, but it was a 10 most wanted posters up in the Logan Post Office is where he saw the sign because that was before the internet and when the government wanted to hire people they sort of put signs up in the post office. So there it was. NASA looking for scientists and engineers to go work in space. And because on the bottom of the poster it said, NASA is an equal opportunity employer, I went, oh, okay, I can try applying, even though I'm a girl. So. Good for you. All right. Yeah. And Dr. Thomas, how did you get involved? I always wanted to be an astronaut since I was about six years old. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as a little boy, I watched uh, the first American go into space uh, back in 1961. And as soon as that launch was over, I said to myself, I want to do that. And so I worked hard. I kept focused on that my entire life, my entire career, through high school and college. Uh, almost everything, every decision was towards that, sure. in that direction. I sometimes deviated, but I worked in that direction. And then I ended up working as an engineer down at uh, the NASA Johnson Space Center for a few years before I finally got selected. So All right. And the selection process that you just brought up, I mean, how rigorous was that itself? Uh, the application process? the selections? Well, I, the, it, you're applying for a civil service job, but there are a whole lot more medical forms that you fill out. Okay. <laughs> and the interview process is pretty interesting. I know for me, I, I was really nervous because I walk into the interview and there's John Young. I mean, he walked on the moon, you know. And he asked me, so what'd you do in high school? I'm sort of going, you know. So that, that was pretty amazing because you had all these really incredible people on this board sure. asking a question. I didn't expect, I expected more technical questions and I had really prepared, but it was all more trying to get at who you were as a person. As a person, ah, yeah. Okay. They figured y y the technical stuff you had nailed, or they wouldn't have had you down there in the first place. So. Right. They were asking me, uh, "What shoe do I put on first in the morning? Your right or your left?" 
and I, I felt like I was getting this series of stupid questions, and I was about to say, what are you guys doing? You know, we got one hour in here. Let's get to the, you know, the meat of the matter. <laughs> but they were just poking me to yeah. see what kind of person you are, to see well, how, how does this guy react if he gets five stupid questions in a row. Yeah. And so I, I recognized what they were doing, and I went along with it. If you want to talk about what chew I put on first, I'm okay with that. You know, <laughs> you know, we just went through the interview. Okay, was that similar? To, did yeah. that see it similar feeling? Yeah, yeah, and and it was it was really pretty amazing I mean, because after, you know, when I was down in Houston, I got to sit on the board as we were interviewing people. Oh. And and it was just amazing because I'd watch them go through this whole process, but from the other side, you know, and it, you'd watch each of them go click. I know what's going on here. You know, <laughs> it's really amazing. So tell me, the day you were selected, how did that uh, resonate with you? What did you? What were your feelings that day? Uh, it was a great day. Uh, this is the fourth time I'd applied. Oh, okay. Yep. And uh, I was working in mission control. I had an experiment on one of the shuttle missions, and I came home that day, and my mom happened to be in town visiting. She was living overseas, working at one of the American embassies. She just happened to be in town. I got home, and I saw a little red light on my message machine. I saw I got a message, and I hit it. And it was from NASA saying, uh, this is Don Putty, who is the director of the flight crew operations uh, director. And he said, you know, please give me a call back. And I knew, I said, I think I'm in. And I immediately picked up the phone and called him. And, you know, he asked me, uh, you know, if I was still interested in being uh, an astronaut because he liked to offer me the job. And I said something really intelligent, like, habada, habada, habada. <laughs> <laughs> I finally said yes, and I hung up the phone. And then I just, I screamed for 10 minutes jumping up and down I bet Mary did the same I'm sure you did yeah. it's such yeah. an incredible call to get yeah. and it was really special because my mom was there and right. she'd been overseas and she helped raise me as a single parent and to, to be able to share that moment with her it was just sheer luck that she was there at the time yeah. but okay. a great day yeah so you've both been selected and then we move on to the next step uh, training how how was, was the was the training experience so it was extremely rigorous well, mm. I, when I started training, I, I went down to Houston before the first shuttle flight. So things were a little different because um, we didn't really know how the system was going to perform. And uh, so When was your first flight? Your, your first flight? I, was my first flight was in 85. 85, okay. So um, it was a 23rd flight of the shuttle. So um, when, uh, when I started, we had more of the training that, the, that they had during Apollo, it wasn't really refined for the shuttle systems yet. Um, and so for the first year, we were teaching each other. It, it was sort of, and, and they ramped up the amount of work you did. So at first, there was a lot more book work than I expected. And uh, I mean, I was sitting in aerodynamics classes with a bunch of test pilots, you know, if we, which was really sort of, I mean, you know, all my aerodynamics comes from the inside of sewer pipes. I'm a, you know, I'm a civil sanitary <laughs> engineer. And then I remember one day I was, Go, I really got what was going on because I went, oh yeah, an airplane is just an inside-out sewer pipe. Well, test pilots really didn't like that statement, but you know, you know, according to the equations, in my mind, you know, that was it. So, it was, so we had this sort of cultural thing. I got to try to teach Jerry Ross how to swim. He'd grown up. He was a lead flight test engineer on the B-1 bomber. I was shocked that the Air Force would do that amount of airplane work over the water and never teach this guy how to swim. So just things like that. It was really fun. Okay, and, I, and then I know that you joined the program. I think uh, ten ten years after Mary. Uh, yeah, I, leave and I started in 1990, and I first flew in 1994. And uh, the shuttle it was flying. You know, when I started, it was in between the uh, Challenger and Columbia accidents. So we were flying right. multiple flights. So it was you know come in the door. We were training. They had the training routine well hammered out by then. And uh, I had two years of generic training about the shuttle and the systems and the spacesuits, and then got assigned to my first mission and then went into a two-year training program just focusing on the tasks for that flight. But it's a, it's a great job being assigned to a mission. Sure. You know, it's busy, it's hectic, it's, uh, it takes you away from home a lot, but it, it's a great time. So it's not necessarily the rigorous training that we would think uh, you'd be putting through like miles of running and fitness and... Not like that, it's rigorous in that there's a lot you have to know. Yes. You can't okay. afford so to forget more. anything, but it is that fun kind of, of uh, you know, rigor that, that you enjoy, like having a, being totally exhausted at the end of a vacation because you climbed every mountain and, and you did everything you wanted to do. It's kind of like that kind of rigor, all fun stuff. Yes. But there was just so much that you needed to know and you had to make sure you knew it. You know, we can't of afford course. to make mistakes. 
All right. And then trying on the suit for the first time. Tell me what that was like. The first time I went in the, the suit was in an underwater tank. It was called the, the WETF, the Weightless Environment Test Facility. And I remember getting in the suit, and the, uh, we have scuba divers who help weigh us out to make sure we don't rise and don't sink. And I just remember looking out the visor, and I thought, I'm a spaceman here. You know, I, for the first time, I felt like an astronaut being in that suit, like I was in space just floating there. It was, I had a big smile on my face. I'm sure you did. Yeah. yeah. I never had that experience because I was too small to get suited. Oh, well then tell me about that. Why? Um... Because they, those, those suits then cost $1.25 million a piece. So they made a decision they were only going to suit the mid-range of the core. So all the really small guys and then the really big guys were sort of out of luck. Well, for me, I was really disappointed when I found out I wasn't going to be able to uh, go on a spacewalk. But then I got assigned to a flight. My first flight had uh, two spacewalks on it. But I, they couldn't suit yeah. me, so they ended up having to train me as the flight engineer on the shuttle, which was really amazing because every other guy on that flight was a test pilot, and Woody had gone to both packs and, and Eddie, so he was a double test pilot. So, you know, here I was, a flight engineer. But it, so it ended up for me, the trade was fabulous. I mean, I I was so happy to be part of the flight. Yeah, trip. I'm sure. And of it course. was really unusual being a woman. I mean, I remember going out to Edwards. You know, we were flying on the STA, being out there and drinking at the bar and. You know, and, and this was after my first flight, and I had a Mach 25 patch on, and an SR-71 driver came up to the bar and, and said, Mach 2.5, wow, that's pretty good. And then, I, well, one of the astronauts I was with said, it's Mach 25, idiot. And this guy just sort of <laughs> collapsed and faded away. You know, test pilots are pretty macho. And it was just sort of like, oh, I think I'm in a place that women aren't really hanging around that much. You know, so. so the space suits wasn't necessarily part of, um the takeoff, like for safety, I think. We have different suit pressure suits, uh, for that. but those came in after the after the Challenger accident, after the first accident. Um, for my first flight, we were just in cotton flight, uh, you know, bags, jumpsuits, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, just a bag, and and it was very loose. I mean, we had little helmets that we put on, but we left them up, and you know, we literally were unstrapped, sitting on the back of the chairs, cracking jokes right until right before you know we lifted off, and we strapped in and went. It was. It was a little different uh, second flight. A little flight. looser. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was way looser the first flight <laughs> after the first accident. Then we were in pressure suits, and, and it was a lot more rigorous. So. Okay, so the suits were basically assigned to people that they thought were going to be doing uh, space walks. Yeah, two different suits. Yes, yeah, okay. The, yeah, ascent and entry suits, yeah. and then the space suits. Got it. Yeah. One's are partial pressure suits. The other are, are total pressure suits. All right. Well, thank you for the discussion on getting to the program and into the program. We're going to take a little bit of a break, and uh, then we'll be right back. Okay. Being led out, really, by uh, mission specialist uh, Norm Thaggard, uh, Mark Lee, uh, Mary Cleave, T-minus 15, 14, 13, and liftoff. Seven. feet per second. Booster and Brian and Mary and the uh, flight deck are preparing for the first of the two spacewalks. The arm flies wonderfully. It's just such a great tool, um, real smooth, and uh, no surprises. Um, being able to interact with them, and, and they gave me some real good directions while we were up there. We controlled it with our little experiment computer, which worked great. Different floppy disks for each experimental one. Here's Mary at the overhead windows. This is our primary vantage point for Earth observation photography. Yeah, I sort of shared doing the, the food cooking duties. It's where we got hungry first seemed to be the person that would end up cooking. Um, but it's actually a lot easier in zero-g going up the stairs. In one-g, you have to be careful and take the trays one at a time, these bags, before we unpack them. You can see it took up a lot of space down here. A lot of times at work, I feel like I'm running around in circles, and so I tried actually running around in circles, and it worked up there, and it was a lot of fun. Walker. Well, welcome back. Here we are again, joined by Dr. Mary Cleave and Dr. Donald Thomas. And now I would like to get into the actual aspects of the flight itself. Um, I think this is what most people would really want to know about. It's mm -hmm. exciting to me. Um, the takeoff. What were your thoughts before the takeoff? You know, the, the first mission, I just, I wanted to go so bad. I dreamed my whole life of this, uh, of that event. I was 39 years old in my first launch. And when the engines lit and I could feel the push in my back, meaning that we had taken off, 
I had my helmet on, visor was down, and I was screaming inside my helmet like, Yahoo, let's go. Uh, nobody could hear me, uh, but I, I would imagine some of the other rookies were doing the same thing. There's a lot of noise, a lot of shaking, a lot of vibration going on, but when you feel that push, you know you've taken off. First two minutes are a rough ride, and then after the solid rocket boosters separate, yeah. uh, it really smooths down. Very you know, steady acceleration. You get pushed back in your seat a little more and more. And it's only an eight and a half minute trip to space, which is always amazing to me. Yeah. And how, how did you feel about that first, getting on board and here we go? Yeah, that, well, it was totally different for me between my first and second flights. My, oh, first okay. flight, my first flight, I was a flight engineer. And so I was really focused on what was going on. I mean, it was, you know, it was the 23rd flight of the shuttle. We had lots of things that were happening that we didn't know about. You know, flight, kind of a flight engineer, sort of like a pilot, and part well, they, of the well, the commander sits there, and the pilot sits there, and the flight engineer sits in the middle, and they have all these switches and stuff. Yes, that they, you know, you're responsible for, and then, you know, if, if things get really bad, you try to make sure that the commander and the pilot stay coordinated when they're working through their their retrieval of trying to get the shuttle back. I mean, mm -hmm. it, during the actual flight, you know, we're lucky, you know, because. Usually it's pretty straightforward, but I, you know, you always want to stay ahead of the power curve when you're flying, and so you're trying to stay ahead of where you are. So I was so concentrated, I didn't feel anything on my first flight. I Amazing. Didn't, I mean, I feel felt the 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 main engines, and then I, you know, and then the bang, bang and the and then you're you're going, and then I was so totally focused. All of a sudden we were floating around. It was eight and a half minutes later, and I'm going. I trained for five years. For that, you know, <laughs> it was just sort of like because it was just there and it was gone. You know, um, second flight, I was down in the mid deck all by myself because um, Mark Lee was a rookie. I t asked him what, what he wanted on the flight deck, so he was up there only five of us. I thought it was going to be lousy, but I, I asked Red Flash, the commander, if I could just come off mic, and he said, if I say cleave, I'm, I said I'll come back up, and then. I was down there and I was hooting and hollering. It is the greatest ride when you don't have any work to do. Sure. It was just fabulous. You know, my first mission, I was sitting down in the mid deck. You have no responsibility, really, nothing to monitor. And I could feel every slightest yeah. movement of the shuttle and, and the noise, you know, I could hear. I was really in tune with what was going on. My second flight, I was up on the flight deck, you know, sitting next to where Mary would have launched from. And it was a totally different experience. Mm -hmm. It was like visual overload. Yeah. I was able to look out one of the windows with a little mirror. You're monitoring the instruments. And if you asked me, was it noisy? I would say, I don't know. Yeah. Was the thing shaking? I don't know. <laughs> but, but wow, what a view out the window. Yeah. So it was a totally different experience from one seat to the, to the next. Both equally, as Mary said, you know, equally impressive, like really cool event. Yeah, but I can bet. On our first flight, we when the solid rocket motors came off, and they have their own rockets that separate it from the shuttle, and we were we launched at night, and we hadn't been debriefed by anybody that launched at night. There'd only been one other, I think, one other night launch ahead of us about the solid rocket motor separation, and we were enveloped in flames from their separation rockets, and every single one of us we went oh shit, <laughs> and um, and then all of a sudden we flew through it, and it was fine. It was like oh okay, we're <laughs> we're all we're fine, you know. It's just yeah. sort of like. So there were things like that uh, because of the view that you don't just right. don't get down. Yeah. In the so you, you had two flights, <laughs> and I believe you had four. Yeah, four. Four yeah. flights. Okay. And you were both times on Atlantis. Yes. And what three times on Columbia, once on Discovery. Once on Discovery. Okay. And so once you're in flight and you're in space now, and you were talking about your view, the views. What what were some of the things that you just had to see? Some of the landmarks that you just had to see that you could see, I suppose. Was there anything like that? It, yeah. I wanted to see Mount Everest. I was going to ask that. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to know that. So before the mission, I had maps and, and other photos so I could identify it. And, and that's, a, that's a cool thing. So you could you see know, it? You could see oh, it. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's a small little mountain down there in the midst of all the Himalayan mountains. But once you zoom in on it and, and, and you can recognize it, it, it's really cool to be able to say, I, I've seen the top of Mount Everest 25 times on my flights. So yeah. Not many people can say that. <laughs> I always admit it's a lazy man's way to see the top of Mount Everest. <laughs> yeah. But but things like the Great Barrier Reef, yeah. what else, Mary? What, I'm it, sure. Just, I, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I, I really have fun. We, on our, our um, second flight, we were, it was daylight over Houston. So I really had fun because we were living in Houston and I had fun just looking down, waving. Hey, guys, yeah. how you doing? Yeah, it's your hometown. Yeah, you know, yeah. So I mean, I was a little more 
provincial, but for me, really looking out was a thing. Cause I was a flight engineer in my first flight, so I had to identify stars. Because, oh, okay. Y you know, for backup, you have to be able to do marks on stars to get your navigation system mm -hmm. set up. And um, I, I was a little nervous about this, you know, because you go to a planetarium and, you, you know, you learn all your nav stars and, you know, that kind of stuff. And then you look out in a 238, there are a lot more stars. And you know when you get up there, there are going to be a lot more stars. So I darkened up. You have to get your eyes darkened. I have to look down. And I was just overwhelmed with all the stuff you could see when you're outside the atmosphere. You just can't see it from here. And it was just sort of like, I'll never find the stars. It was like this, I'll never find the stars. But then you start getting, you know, you're, you're set up and you can see the colors better. So it's it's actually, once you get used to it, it's, 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 it's pretty easy. But boy, that first, oh my God, looking at everything out there, it's really busy out there. With stars, I bet, yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I don't know that if I should know the answer to this question, but is there night and day? We orbit the Earth uh, every no, hour and a half. Thoughts, I just wasn't yeah. sure. We get 45 minutes of daylight typically and 45 minutes of nighttime. So we see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every 24-hour day. It's okay. an amazing place up there. That's because of the pure speed that you're... Just because yeah. we're orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes. So right. Yeah. yeah. All right, so you saw Everest that you really wanted to see. I was, I was hoping that would come up, that you saw so it. So Everest, uh, I, I like looking down uh, in South America at the rainforest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, yeah. okay. In, Throughout Brazil, they were cutting down a lot of the rainforest. There were huge fires that yeah. you could see at night. And during my first mission, the entire continent of South America was under a smoke pall yeah. uh, from the burning of the rainforest. And, and you hear about, yeah, we're clearing out the rainforest, and you think, oh, that's a, s a small city, a state, a country. But it, it was affecting the entire continent. Yeah. And, and I think that's the perspective we probably both have of being yeah. in space. You see the effects of human activity globally, yeah. and not just regionally here. What we do here affects the whole planet. Yeah, and, and I was actually going to ask well. you, um, yeah. ask you that. Yeah. About I mean, I got to watch a um, dust storm come off of the uh, north part of Africa, and, and over the four days, it blew right across the Atlantic Ocean, and it was sitting over Florida. You know, and so you, people go, "Well, how did this fungal infection get from those coral reefs over here?" Well, if you've been in space, you understand it's just it's one planet. You know, you're down yeah. here, an ocean seems like a barrier. You're up there looking down, it's not, not at all. really a barrier. Yeah, I understand. So it, it makes everything shrink. But, you know, a lot of the guys get up and they talk about how it's wonderful because, you know, it's one planet and we're all together on one planet. And I'm an environmental engineer, so I'm looking down, I'm seeing, like in Africa, different land use policies of the different governments. You can see geopolitical borders because of that. And I'm, I'm sort of going, one, wait a minute one planet no look look what those guys are doing to those guys <laughs> you know it's yeah. just sort of like different perspective sure so. yeah i was actually uh, really wondering that all right well let's take a break on that part and uh we'll, we'll return in a minute science and biological sciences from colorado state university she's got a master of science in microbial ecology from utah state and a phd in civil and environmental engineering from utah state and I think she'll tell us why she went to Utah State here, right, coming up. She was selected by NASA in 1980 in the ninth group of astronauts. She's a veteran of two space shuttle missions. STS-61B, it was aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis back in 1985. I just want to say, Mary, you're in the top ten. Okay. Just made it. So please join me in welcoming a national hero, a good friend, and a really great, great person, Dr. Mary Cleave. So um, I'm glad to see so many people here today um, on a Saturday morning. I have a little trouble getting home myself. Um, it's uh, always nice to talk to you about how lucky I am. I've had a great career. Um, Don asked me to talk to you about how I got into the astronaut program, just in case any of you think you want that kind of job, because it's really a lot of fun. Um, I sort of never... Welcome back, everybody. And again, we're joined by Dr. Cleve, Dr. Donald Thomas. And I would like to ask you about the program at Towson University, what current you're currently doing since your days of being astronauts. Okay, I, uh, I left NASA about five and a half years ago and joined Towson University, where I'm the director of the Hackerman Academy of Math and Science, which is a, an outreach program. And we try to get young students across Maryland elementary, middle, and high school students interested in careers in math and science and engineering. And our Saturday, science, uh, Saturday morning science program that we do at Towson is one element of that where we bring in 
different speakers like Mary, uh, other scientists and engineers from the area to talk about their careers, to get the kids excited <coughs> about math and science, to show them that these, to these topics, these careers are, are not hard, they're fun, mm -hmm. you know, and to try to change their mindset that this is something that they want to do as well. Okay, and I believe you've been given some le lectures at... Uh, I gave a lecture up for Don. He, yes. he also gives lectures and he's very good. <laughs> as an astronaut, you, you get to talk a lot to, to share your experience, which I think is is an important part of the job. You yeah. know, if we, only 550 of us have gone into space, and if no, but none of us talked about it, it would, it would be an incredible waste, so. So you go out and give lectures in, in Maryland schools? Do I do that. I, I go to uh, 75 or 80 schools across Maryland every year and talk to right. sometimes a class, small group, sometimes uh, an auditorium, a couple hundred kids, uh, just trying to share that excitement. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you know, sometimes we get asked, uh, so now the you know the space program is kind of boring compared to the glory days of Apollo, and, and kids aren't as interested anymore. And it's like, oh no, uh, when you see the the young kids when you're talking about space, it's such a magical world where things float and sure. you see the whole planet. That I think the kids today are just as excited uh, as when I was a kid about the space program. Yeah. So, Dr. Cleve, this we've been talking about this and showing pieces of this lecture. Why don't you explain? Uh, Talk about your experience in the lecture. And yeah, well, I think for, for my talk up at, at Towson, I uh, used a, a crew movie from my first space flight. And you, after you uh, fly in space, the crew gets together and they put together, it's sort of like your, your travel movie of, what, of exactly what you did on your flight. And so, you know, it just goes through the entire experience, which is fun. And I grew with Don. I mean, the kids are just, when I was up at Towson, I mean, there were a lot, of, I was I was pleased because there were a lot of little girls in the audience. I mean, there were, there were boys too, and that was good, but there were a lot of little girls, and they were just really excited. And if I could get one of those little girls to think about being an engineer, then it was worth taking the Saturday and go up and doing that. And at the beginning of the lecture, Mary spent five or 10 minutes talking about how she became an engineer, how she became an astronaut. And I think it's important for the young girls, young boys out there to hear these stories so that they can formulate their own thoughts of, of how they're going to get into their career as well. Mm -hmm. And every person has a different story yeah, about how they, before, they yes. achieved whatever they did in their life. And, and I think for the young kids, it's, it's important to, to hear those stories, that it isn't always a straight line, and, no. and it isn't always, always successful. Sometimes you have setbacks along the way, and Mary did a great job explaining her background yeah, expect, there. explaining how I wanted to be a veterinarian, but they wouldn't take women into vet school, so I had to find another job. Man, I'm lucky. I got. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not always easy. I mean, we we come in, I think, as motivators. Yeah. Okay. You know, and the, it's hard for a teacher when they're yeah, signing homework and doing all that kind of stuff. They, you know, they might need some help from outside motivators to get the kids to realize why they need to do all the work that's being assigned to them and stuff. And that's where we come in. That that spark that Mary mentioned, uh, if you can excite one kid that day. Right. And, and change them and, and get them saying, I'm going to go do this. That That is what it's all about, mm -hmm. one at a time. So maybe not everybody knows about these programs, but uh, they might see this particular show. How should they go about getting involved and getting in touch with? At Towson University, just go to uh, www.towson.edu slash Hackerman Academy, H-A-C-K-E-R-M-A-N Academy. And uh, we have a website. They'll have our schedule of our Saturday morning science events. Okay. And they're free, open to everybody. And we hope you'll come and join us some Saturday morning. Yes. All right. And we hope you'll come to the Maryland Women's Heritage Center to see the STEM exhibit. That the we the have great exhibit for yes. women in science and engineering, math, and in uh, technology in the state of Maryland. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mary. That was a very inspirational story. Thank Thanks. you very much. And thank you, Dr. Thomas. You're very welcome. Yes. So from the Women's Heritage Center, Maryland Women's Heritage Center, I'm your host, Simon Harrington. Goodbye.